because, as Eileen tells us, there are cross-hatched spaces that are completely permeable and allow for contact between the neighbourhoods. The cross-hatcher of disciplinary boundaries, and both Eileen and Aranya are cross-hatchers, must maintain a fidelity to what Claude Romano, a thinker Eileen introduced me to, in event and world refers to as eventiality. The self-shattered academic subject who opens themselves up to the other, to the event to come that Eamon spoke of earlier, is what Eileen, after Romano, termed an ambulant, one who is constitutively open to events and to the self-divestiture, quite literally in Eileen's case, when she gave up a tenured position to commit the rest of her life to punctum books and to publishing the work of others. Bravo for that. In moving rhythmically with and toward our academic neighbours, we answer as advidants an ethical call or imperative, professing our neighbour love for the strangers around us while asking what exactly it means to love our academic neighbours as such. As we navigate the ruins of Bill Redding's university in ruins and transgress the cross hatches of disciplinary boundaries, we answer to a duty, as Eileen and Aranya remind us, a responsibility to listen to others while subjecting ourselves to encounters with otherness. This is ongoing work, however, because as Claude Romano explains, an encounter is not so much a presentation of two people as a futurition. It has meaning only through the possibilities that it holds in reserve, which give it its future loading. So this encounter today, or these encounters, like the dialogue or duologue we're about to hear between Aranye and Eileen, are beginnings that never end, because futuritions constantly defer themselves by opening ceaseless new possibilities. So here's to opening ceaseless new possibilities. Arnie is going to open our duologue, uh, but I wanted to briefly say uh, thank you very much to Michael O'Rourke, Aileen Dunn, and Aidan Siri for creating this fabulous uh, colloquium, um, and also to the School of Education at Trinity for helping host this event. And thanks to everyone who's here, and Arnia will start. Probably most of us would agree that however expert we might become in this or that specialty, we are not richly educated until we have some experience of a wide range of disciplines and methodologies, a range that includes critique and creativity, analysis <coughs> and immersion, learning and unlearning. To our summer, this conception of education is rapidly losing favor with the citizenry. San Francisco is, however, taking to the courts to defend its city college's course offerings from the so-called student success movement, which preaches efficiency and progress to the degree. The accrediting commission for community and junior colleges is trying to shut City College down, and the San Francisco district attorney has filed suit to protect it. CCSF has actually maintained better graduation rates than most uh, community colleges in the country. The real target of the Accreditation Commission is the wide range of services CCSF provides for San Franciscans not aiming for a degree, like the Queer Resource Center, the Women's Resource Center and Library, English classes for recent immigrants, parenting classes for new parents, technical and clerical training, music, painting, and sound engineering. Colleges like CCSF are points of crossover between the academy and the rest of the world. They treat culture shock, give the elderly new leases on life, and resist the ongoing ensurfment of all creatures. The student success movement means to impoverish sentience, not to enrich it. It's a Thatcherite attempt to discipline and punish, and capitalists love it. But why do so many other people fall for it? Most students and parents hate teachers, at least some of the time. 
for subjecting said students to apparently impersonal standards. If we give little Oliver the grade we think he really deserves, assuming that we could tell what that was, if we make him sit one exam after another, or if we don't even let him into college, then why should we escape external assessment and accountability? If academics play, experiment, muck about with things and other people's money, then we are Zizekian thieves of enjoyment and we wreak havoc in what Lacan once called the dollar zone, ruled by the fantasy of equivalence between and among persons, objects, and symbols. Academic knowledge is edgy, hard to evaluate, and takes a long time to metabolize. Hence, while our new understandings of neuroplasticity and neuronal connectivity make the argument for the value of liberal arts learning, they remain quiet in educational policy debates. Arguably, however, the integration, not homogenization of brain functions, is the goal of education. Educational theorist Wolf Singer strongly emphasizes the roles of connectivity and integration in adult learning. Quote, the only major change that nervous systems have undergone during evolution is a dramatic increase in complexity. That is to say, not only a massive increase in the number of nerve cells, but also a stunning increase in their interconnections, including, quote, numerous long-range connections linking nerve cells that are distributed across remote areas of the brain. De Blasio similarly believes that the experience of selfhood depends on connections between the primitive brain stem and the new orbitofrontal regions of the brain, just as Edelman argues for the role of the primitive basal ganglia in the creation of the redundancy loops that play such an important role in neuroplasticity. A lot that we think is new or modern or postmodern derives from links to the oldest parts of the triune brain, which still participate actively in the developmental processes in which selection of cortical circuits depends on experience, such that, as Singer puts it, frequently occurring correlations in the outer world can be translated into the architecture of connections. Our environments and histories, in other words, are actually built into the functional architecture of the brain. Uh, Singer also notes that arousal and attention are required to induce lasting changes in the circuitry of the brain. Rewards, hence pleasure or lack thereof, will be relevant here, as also behavioral significance, especially since genetic scripts appear to derive from past experience. Educational researcher Tracy Takahama Espinoza invokes a number of epigenetic factors in her survey of <coughs> brain functions as they relate to human survival and life skills, skills that are needed to survive both in academic settings and social situations. Her list of these major brain functions includes affect, empathy, and motivation, executive decision-making functions, facial recognition and interpretation, memory, attention, social cognition, spatial management, and temporal management, her terms. These are among the functions that Singer regards as crucial to epigenetic connectivity. Their interactions forge the links between brain architecture and worldly experience at stake in both surviving and thriving. As I argue in Staying Alive, it's the particular brief of the arts and humanities to enhance the skills on which thriving and surviving depend. We cannot satisfy a need, assuming we could identify one in the first place, without experiencing things like pleasure, triumph, abjection, shame. So the interconnections of these functions are crucial. The role of affect in decision making, in focusing attention, for example. Takahama also stresses the importance of nonverbal forms of communication in teaching, facial expressions and the like. Hence, 
also the role of sensory experience in learning even the most abstract of symbolicities. These prosodic and performative elements are at work in the earliest modes of intersubjectivity also, which take place in the context of the attachment process, sorry, which take place in the context of the attachment process. Indeed, the affective power of attachment is one of the most important reasons for and aspects of the profound intersubjectivity uh, of learning. The psychoanalyst Wilfred Vion emphasizes the intersubjectivity of the work of linking and thinking, whereby the attachment figure helps the baby to process chaotic feelings and especially dread by naming them and thus connecting them to uh, uh, other experiences. Quote, uh, actually this is from Takahama Espinosa, the brain is a social organ that thrives on interaction with others. Without theory of mind, the kind of learning we do would be impossible because we have to learn how other minds think in order to learn from them in the first place. The theory of mind also relies on sensory and aesthetic experience. It is a kind of environmental theory. Tokuhama Espinoza suggests a link between emotional intelligence and metacognition. Paul Howard Jones, in his book, Introducing Neuroeducational Research, also stresses the counterintuitive importance of metacognitive factors in training teachers of drama. Analysis is not inimical to creativity, he argues. Instead, they are mutually supportive brain functions. The focused attention and working memory needed for analysis are impossible without affect. Jones's experiments with drama teacher trainees also emphasize the interactions between right and left brain activity. Both hemispheres of the brain are needed for linguistic processing, as I'm sure you all know. The left side specializes in syntax and logic, while the right side specializes in the emotional and social significance of utterances. But if the right brain is damaged, the result is not simply speech that sounds affectless, but rather nonsense. So important are emotional and social contexts in the construction of syntax and logic. And hence the importance of the liberal arts. Scientific method relies largely on quantitative analysis and controlled conditions. Humanistic methods address real-time performance and rhetoric. But attention and memory, affect and the senses are vital to both, and so is relationality. My answer to Malibu's well-known question, what should we do with our brain, is therefore enrich it, uh, because the fact is that many basic brain functions must work together to enable even the narrowest of specializations. How does the concept of unlearning address the neuronal complexity now axiomatic in the new sciences of the brain? Uh, this. Uh, much more interesting things have been said about this concept uh, than, uh, than, well, what I'm about to talk about is, a, is the caricature of unlearning that appears in Descartes and, um, and studies in innovation. Um, so I'm speaking of that, not uh, the way you so beautifully tried to describe what this conference might be trying to open up. Uh, to the extent that the term unlearning presupposes a learning that needs to be undone before new learning can take place, it conjures a linearity that may not be altogether helpful. Here is an example from Descartes. The chief cause of our errors, he wrote, are the prejudices of our childhood. I must seriously address myself to the general upheaval of all my formal opinions, it's in the meditations. Here is another example now from the discourse of organizational psychology. Unlearning often cannot occur until after there has been, sorry, learning often cannot occur until after there has been unlearning. 
of learning is a process that shows people they should no longer rely on their current beliefs and methods. Because current beliefs and methods shape perceptions, they blind people to some potential interpretations of evidence. People hold on to their theories until failures convince them to accept new paradigms. A lot of developmental and psychoanalytic theory tells a similar story about how our relational expectations, uh, patterns of anticipation, preparedness, anxiety, hope, desire, resist modification, producing transference in the analytic situation, and beyond. Time lags because the past lives on in us. Nothing is altogether superseded. But perhaps contemporary psychoanalytic models of mixture and palimpsest differ from the narrative of unlearning that I've just been describing on this score. Many of us no longer expect our patients to uproot their relational expectations altogether before new ones can begin to form. Freud himself characterized all new relationships as new additions, facsimiles of old ones. Sameness is not a popular goal these days, and for very good reasons when it's invoked to support the fantasy that difference can be eradicated. But as so much queer theory has noted, both difference and sameness are concepts that function relative to larger networks of conceptualization and evaluation. Few things are completely the same or completely different from other things, partly because sameness and difference are, again, in the end, relativized abstractions we use to create and modify patterns. And that if the desire for sameness is or can be part of us, there is something in sameness for us. What might that be? Freud precedes his account of the simplest organism in Beyond the Pleasure Principle with the paradoxical claim that staying the same is the goal of all becoming. We change because of our wish for repose, ultimately for inanimacy. The quote, external, disturbing, and diverting influences responsible for the phenomena of organic development elicit responses that bring about change in the organism, but said responses are merely seeking to reach an ancient goal by paths alike old and new. By attributing the dynamism of organic development exclusively to the impingements of the external environment on the organism, Freud maintains a distinction between the creature's desire and its ecology that is no longer tenable. But he at least insists that the development of organisms can only be understood in the context of the history of the earth we live in and of its relation to the sun. He invites us to suppose that all the organic instincts are conservative, are acquired historically, and tend towards the restoration of an earlier state of things. It is a paradox worth considering that the drives have a history partly because they tend toward the restoration of an earlier state of things. Because the organic instincts are acquired historically, through long ages of experience and reality testing, because they have been such a long time in becoming, the past is built into them and they have an allegiance to it. This is a narrative that foregrounds intimacies between sameness and difference, or conservation and exploration, two of the really important terms in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. We need some such story to reckon with the organism's puzzling determination, so hard to fit into any context, as Freud says, to maintain its own existence in the face of every obstacle. The organism insists on following its own path to death and warding off any possible ways of returning to inorganic existence other than those which are imminent in the organism itself. Here, Freud is not so very far from Francisco Varela's use of the term apopoiesis 
to refer to the creature's constant remaking of itself in accordance with its necessarily particular potentialities, affordances, and provisions. Borella conceives of autopoiesis as always highly interactive, by the way, with the organ, organism's environment. It's a systems term, not meant to designate individual autonomy. Quote, an autopoietic machine, for example, a cell, uh, is organized as a network of processes of production of components which, through their interactions and transformations, continually regenerate the network of processes that produce them and constitute the machine as a concrete unity in space. Each cell participates in a lavish network of biochemical connections in order to regenerate itself as a concrete unity in space. Autopoiesis resists not aggregation or multiplicity, but pure stasis. What we now know of uterine life is that as soon as we have ears to hear, we hear all the world around us. But we are also born with already acquired preferences for the music, the stories, the tastes, and smells of our prenatal lives. Becoming, yes, but is becoming really beyond attachment? That's my question to the wisdom of the play. So what is the point of proposing that a linear process must take place, learning cannot, often cannot occur until after we've unlearned? Rather than positing that experimentation and its failures are simply part of all learning activities, changing, transforming, plasticizing, playing. For that matter, why would we not posit that experimentation is essential to all living process? Certainly, we can think about habits, ideology, expertise, and the like as entrenched materially by the forming of strongly linked neural pathways that then guide us non-consciously. But what does it avail us to think of the process of learning anew as the equivalent of blowing up an old building to make way for a new one? Might it not be possible instead to diverge, recontextualize, instead of undo, to create new alternative pathways that intersect with old neuronal patterns and thus make creative use of them in the project of living? Particularly if we keep in mind the role of affect in the formation of memories. The question of why we cling or adhere to tradition is a matter of affective investments, of cathexis and decathexis. It is not clear to me that we can unlearn without undergoing mourning. The giving up of the old uh, of home, uh, moreover, in order to make way for the new, is one of our most ancient and contemporary calls to sacrifice, and thus should only be looked at carefully. Freud changed course on this point, acknowledging in a letter to Binsfanger that the substitution of an old object for a new one was not an adequate conceptualization, since, as he put it, mourning is never really over. Studies of creativity show us over and over again that new learning depends on old knowledge. Arguably, the Renaissance could not have happened without medieval skepticism, dissent, and iconoclasm. Studies of social learning make similar claims. If the elders in a tribe are wiped out prematurely, the result is not the opportunity to innovate. Well, it is an opportunity to innovate. But it's also true uh, that damage is done to the tribe's capacity for making. Smart behavioral ethologists argue that neophobia and neophilia are not opposites, but rather elements in an always already ongoing and mutually constitutive vital process of responsiveness. Even Deleuze and Guattari argue for the radical potential of archaisms in history just as Jane Bennett has claimed that pre-modern materialist understandings of sympathetic bonds and antipathetic lines of flight might inspire new respect for the vitality of all things. 
how then should we think about attachment in the age of complexity theory? Emergence, the concept of emergence, seems to resolve so many problems and antinomies. A new open system does not so much reject as reboot on a level of greater complexity the elements of previous systems. Does that mean we can focus on contemporaneity without worrying about the past? It's still with us, so if we work on us, we're also working on it. And maybe its artifacts, its DNA can emerge again, chock full of new significances and material effects that nonetheless could not be were it not for the old ones. We have certainly made arguments like this. Scale offers similar opportunities, the concept of scale. Now we can think about decades, epochs, historical periods, the entire Anthropocene and beyond as different ways of shaping time in the pursuit of certain questions. Foucauldian discontinuism and Foucauldian ge genealogy perhaps turn out to be the same thing, or at least complementary. The tempting quality of these formulations gives us all the more reason to raise the question of the value of what we learn relative to the value of what we feel. Not that these are radically distinct. Do our new-ish ways of thinking ask us to sacrifice the experience of attachment, love, bonding, relationality, intersubjectivity, and transsubjectivity? Because all of these involve bonds that do not easily let go. The networks of material relationships always under construction that affect our circumstances are still relationships that have implications for all affective experience. If the sympathies and antipathies that build molecules are an instance of the tendencies to aggregation and autopoiesis characteristic of living process, on what basis do we assume that our reluctance to change shape is simply an effect of the limitations of subjectivity? What exactly does it avail us to turn irreversible change into higher levels of complexity? What do we lose when we lose lack? In current environmental theory, the soothing, apparently optimistic aspects of the holistic concept of ecology, uh, those that tempt us to think everything will adjust somehow, uh, the Wolves of Chernobyl style of consolation. I don't know whether you know this little documentary, but it's all about how the wolves have moved into the abandoned dwellings in Chernobyl, you know, and are thriving and having happy, you know, lives free of interference from human beings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Our kind of, okay, so let me redo the sentence. In current environmental theory, the soothing, apparently optimistic aspects of the holistic concept of ecology are cut across by the real tear in the fabric of the real promised by the current explosion of methane gas from the melting permafrost of the Arctic Circle. Not just the polar bears are headed for the slaughterhouse. Chaos and complexity theory and their offshoots, networks, meshworks, connectivity, dissolve the irreversibility of particular events and actions when and if inspired by melancholy, when what should be a thought becomes a bad object, indistinguishable from a thing in itself, fit only for evacuation. That's beyond. It is not a good idea to void and avoid lack and discontinuity as intolerable thought objects any more than it is to void and avoid continuity and resurgence. The refusal to link and thus think is not the same thing as seeing that a link has been broken. The obsessional defense of undoing, like the wolves of Chernobyl, undoes the acts of destructivity our own, which we imagine not incorrectly to be the reason for our expulsion from paradise. But if we are expelled together, and there is no third, if a couple or coupling have already absorbed the outside ideas that disturb the equilibrium of the imaginary, 
if the damage can be undone one way or another, will we be all right? Who knows? Obsessional doubt also keeps us in the mire of a refusal of attachment, of decision, since any decision represents a loss, and this loss is unbearable. Does unlearning have anything in common with undoing? Or is it an antidote of sorts? Of one thing I am sure, changing people's minds requires empathetic exploration of their attachments to particular viewpoints. As Martin Jordan writes, the radical nature of ecology means that everything is interconnected and it is the job of eco-psychotherapy to help humans negotiate the complex and interdependent present, not by romanticizing the perfect ecological past, nor predicting some future ecological catastrophe, but by bearing to stay with the temporal spaces of the complex present. I am in agreement with the commitment to negotiating the complex and interdependent present but not simply with bearing to stay in the present. Becoming creates but does not stay in spatialized temporalities. To give up yearning, to give up prophecy, to give up fear. Why should we give up love? Why should we give up fear? The language of some future ecological catastrophe dismisses the real that now screens itself in the form of gigantic methane-releasing sinkholes. Complexity and extremity cannot cancel each other out. solid ground, no place you can return to that hasn't changed or decomposed or even been eradicated. At the same time, one doesn't easily slip, as Arnya says, the bonds of attachment, which are also the bonds of history, no matter how changeable that history might be. If current neuroscientific research is right, there is such a thing, as Arnya also intimated, as transgenerational epigenic inheritance. What the hell does that mean in real language? It means I'm carrying around my grandfather's fears and anxieties even if I never met him, maybe even his dreams. And even other more words, things and situations in the environment that affected my relatives may still be affecting me, behaviorally, neuroanatomically, and epigenetically. We'll agree then that there's no escaping tradition and hankering after the new or the never was has its decidedly dark side. Just think of the Taliban demolishing Buddhist statues in Afghanistan in 2001 as a way to reset a historical clock to year zero. You can't accomplish these follies without a lot of violence, usually murder, psychic violence, bodily violence, structural violence. As one of my favorite novelists, Lucy Corin, has said, when apocalyptic thinking is internal, it's rich and beautiful. But enact apocalyptic thinking in real time with real people, and it's just about as fucked up as you can get. Because of history, because there is no new time. Nevertheless, an unthinking embrace of tradition for tradition's sake is equally dangerous, and novelty is important, if only to help us unsettle our habits. We'll admit we can't escape history and Epicurus's laminar void through which atomic particles once reigned and then through various small swerves created our world, cannot be returned to. Although it's interesting, I got onto this thought after hearing a wonderful lecture by Catherine Malibu at Birkbeck College <coughs> on reading Darwin alongside Al Husser's last unfinished piece of writing on the materialism of the encounter. It's a fabulous piece of writing by Al Husser and very weird because it begins with the opening line, it's raining outside, so let's talk about ordinary. Let this book, therefore, above all else, be about ordinary rain. 
And in the course of that writing, he also wondered out loud if it would be possible to return to that void and start over because he felt politics at that point was so fucked up they couldn't be fixed. So we need to think about cultivating certain radical contingencies if only to try to engender material encounters that can't be predicted in advance and out of which alternative life and art practices might become possible. The very problem of politics, in my opinion, is precisely its entrenchment in mentalities and histories and procedures that, that truly can't be and also aren't allowed to be unthought or even just abandoned. But we, so we can't just reboot democracy either by hitting the delete key and starting over. But I honestly worry less about the destructive entrenchment of bad, unnovel, and acquiescent politics. And I worry more about the ways in which transnational, hyper-runaway capital makes even political regimes ultimately inconsequential relative to how things might turn out with respect to climate change, sectarian wars, the end of the university, at least as we thought we knew it, although, as I'll also argue, we've never known what the university is, and pretending we do is like lying to ourselves, and I think that's partly what Paul's talk was about. With Arnia, I neither want to avoid black and discontinuity, nor continuity and resurgence, nor do I want to despair although increasingly I think that has become the position of the left, to just simply be super sad. <laughs> Mark, so Jack mentioned Mark Fisher's book, Capitalist Realism, but if you see his new book, is about being depressed. It's about his actual real depression, and it's about, it's a kind of book that's a testament to giving up, in a way. Like, fuck it, it's too late. Neoliberalism is like, and this is what the accelerationism movement is about. If you don't know about that, just look up. The Accelerationism Manifesto, which has, because it's a bunch of leftists saying you can't stop neoliberalism, it's a runaway train, so instead of trying to uh, get out of the way or stop it, let's just jump on board and see where we go with this. I do not believe, strictly speaking, that there is any longer, nor has there ever been, an outside to depart to, some other ground on which entirely new structures could be built apart from toxic capitalist relations. Although I do think about betrayal a lot more these days. I think about irresponsibility with regard to tradition and innovation. It's interesting, I was thinking about this, the university is always supposed to have been this marvelous locus of innovation, but when you listen to people who run companies talk about innovation, <laughs> it's, uh, it's scary, you know? Because it's just like destroy everything to make way for the new thing, and don't worry if human beings or the environment or whatever gets in the way of that, because innovation's always good. That The guy who took over for Microsoft, right? Did you hear about that speech? He, I can't believe he actually made this public, but he, he gave this little speech to the, yeah, I'm gonna fire 27,000 of you, and then the rest of you are gonna do completely different things than what you're doing now. So figure it out, because we have to put innovation above everything else. So let's think about that when we think about innovation. I kind of want to betray tradition and innovation at the same time in order to plot some kind of uh, life that doesn't necessarily answer to the traditional definitions of what a good life is. I mean, I'm looking at Jack now a little bit because I think a lot of her work and even her talk today has something to do with this resistance to um, the achievement of certain things or success. As Sarah Ahmed has put it, for a life to count as a good life, it must return the debt of its life by taking on the direction promised as a social good. You know, like, you should get married, you should buy a house. Which means imagining one's futurity in terms of reaching certain points along a course. And a queer life would be one that fails to make such a gesture of return. We can't stop looking back or forward, but we might refuse to take on certain inheritances, no matter from which direction they are arriving the past with its traditions and the future with its supposedly inevitable neoliberal accelerationism and resulting technological singularities. I'm interested in gestures of refusal, of non-compliance, and again, of betrayal. 
and in thinking about the ways in which the present might be more of a creatively productive fugitive zone, where time forks and bends everywhere but the past and future, and where we might practice the arts of divergent and richly tapestry becomings. As Arnya writes in a beautiful essay, Discontinuity, A History of Dreaming, somehow the unpredictable depends on what it supersedes. We cannot bypass having a past, and yet at the same time, the work is to keep moving. So yes, let us not necessarily undo nor blow up what we have learned thus far, but let us diverge. Although I might put in a good word for also occasionally bearing to stay, where we might happen to be at any given moment, even if it's the most fucked up place imaginable. Not as a refusal of movement or change or politics, but as a form of resistance to the idea that the only good movement is forward or somewhere other than here, wherever that may be. Maybe there are times when we should embrace being stuck in personal incapacities and what might be called inoperative communities of the exhausted of institutionalized and even post-institutionalized invalids. And increasingly I feel this myself and more so with many people in the university now or just coming out of it, this feeling of exhaustion and just like, you know, you're not technically sick, but you're, you're just, you're, you're tired and you don't feel well. Let's allow ourselves to be at an impasse while also cultivating new arts of care and convalescence, rest and indolence, choosing not to perform versus learning how to perform at ever more high and supposedly calculable levels. I'm borrowing these notions from Jan Verwoerd, who also asks us to consider what it might mean, and I love this because on the one hand, he wants us to have a kind of politics of exhaustion, but that same politics of exhaustion would also be and I love this phrase, existentially exuberant. <laughs> this, this would be a way to perform, and these are his words, without any mandate or legitimation, in response to the desires and dreams of other people, but without the aim of, or pretense of merely fulfilling an existing demand. It is a way of giving too much of what is not presently requested. It is a way of giving what you do not have to others who may not want it. It is a way of transcending your capacities by embracing your incapacities, and therefore a way to interrupt the brute assertiveness of the I can through the performance of the I can't performed in the key of the I can. Isn't that great? It's a way of insisting that even if we can't get it now, we can get it in some other way at some other point in time. That sounds like a good definition of teaching to me. Although I myself have stopped teaching, I have stopped being a professor, partly because the university doesn't feel hospitable to me anymore. It doesn't feel like the right place anymore to enact what Lauren Berlant has called the becoming impasse, or the collaborative risk of a shared disorganization, where it is possible, these are Lauren's words, to value floundering around with others whose attention paying to what's happening is generous and makes liveness possible as a good and not a threat. But I still care about the fate of the public university. Much of my own career, whatever that word means, has been torn between two things kind of continuously. One, wanting to reform the university from within, where the glacial pace of change and seemingly endemic cowardice and personal antipathies have mainly dispirited me. And B, and that's just because, you know, like human beings just suck everywhere, right? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, human beings just kind of suck a lot. You know, you've got to work with them, you know, it's not fun. But you, you thought the university was different than that, because it was like the place where the people were better and like, they're not because they're still people, so they still suck. <laughs> So then the other choice is get out of here because <laughs> uh, these people aren't going to change, you know, because it's institutional. It's an institution. The university is an institution. It has institutional problems. So the other possibility for me is leave and um, found something radically other. Take Derrida seriously. The 
university without condition. Why not try to make that happen? I mean, you know, does it have to be an idea or could it be a thing? This is the place that Derrida believed would remain an ultimate place of critical resistance and more than critical to all the powers of dogmatic and unjust appropriation and which has special safekeeping by way of the humanities entailing the principal right to say everything whether it be under the heading of fiction and the experimentation of knowledge and the right to say it publicly and to publish it. That's why I founded Punctum Books. Of course this is utopian, but isn't the university, hasn't it always been utopian? Has it ever really been realized in the way we think we know what it is? We can bemoan the hyperbolic corporatization of the university where we hardly have time anymore to simply read, think, and write thanks to never-ending rounds of assessment protocols where the defunding of programs continues apace with the adjunctification of teaching lines and an obscenely staggering level of national student loan debt. But the university has always been, in some sense, a bureaucratic institution. Its very institutionality and various modes and protocols of professionalization of disciplinary knowledge necessarily created and sustains a situation where, as Foucault once argued, the production of discourse is at once controlled, selected, organized, and redistributed according to a certain number of procedures, whose role is to avert its powers and its dangers, to cope with chance events, to pervade its ponderous, awesome materiality. We all know perfectly well that we're not free to say just anything, that we cannot simply speak of anything when we like or where we like. Not just anyone, finally, may speak of just anything. So perhaps the university to come is one of those chance and precarious events which with we must now cope and also cultivate. Perhaps we can embrace a deterritorialization of the university, some sort of exodus that is not an escape from obligations and which would be intent on inventing a common world as a space of horizontal negotiations without arbiter, which is are the words of Nicholas Florio from his book, The Radicant where, again, in his words, we would set our roots in motion, staging them in heterogeneous contexts, denying them the power to completely define our identity. We would translate ideas, transcode images, transplant behaviors, and we would exchange rather than impose. And these are my words. We would have roots, but they would always be on the move, effacing their origins in favor of ever more in rootings. This effacement could be painful, of course, even sad. Yet never, and this is to Arnie's point about how attachment and then detaching, you know, involves mourning. But roots remain while also being transited. You can have your place and move it too. Same goes for the classroom, which could be anywhere. There's still a university with a capital U to which we are dedicated, but it isn't the transnational corporation most of us work in today. Rather, following Bill Reddings, it is a collective commitment to spending time in listening to thought. Of course, as Arnett points out again, there's important issues of attachment to work through when we consider where we want to be vis-a-vis -vis learning and teaching, thinking and writing. But isn't there also a productive sort of mourning always attendant upon learning, where one has to lose or let go of and then refine? something practically every day. I always told my students they should want to know more, but first they would have to accept that knowing things entails being sad. I did tell them that. And then they were like, what? There are no certainties. Learning is already unlearning, a continual upending of everything you thought you knew, and therefore difficult and melancholic. Especially when you have to let go of something you thought you couldn't live without. And no one said we had to let go of everything. With Stephen White, I believe in the sustaining affirmations of weak ontologies, strong beliefs, weakly held, and this goes to Fukudo's weak theory as well. Our figurations of self, other, and beyond human are never purely cognitive matters, rather they are always aesthetic affected. Yet a weak ontologist rec recognizes that no one set of figurations can claim universal, self-evident truth. Commitments matter, figurations matter, but we must carry these life goods with us very lightly. I agree that we also have to consider that tear in the fabric of the real, whether climate change catastrophe or even just the ruin of the university as a public trust, 
and whether or not, similar to that tribe for whom the elders have been wiped out, there is irreparable damage to our capacity for making and responsiveness, or is there still an opportunity to innovate? Another way to put this might be, what do we hope for now? As Jonathan Weir explicates in his book, Radical Hope, as finite erotic creatures, it is an essential part of our nature that we take risks just by being in the world. And the world itself is not merely the environment within which we move. It is that over which we lack control. And at any moment may intrude upon us, outstripping the concepts with which we seek to understand it. So in merely thinking the world, we always take the risk that the very concepts which we we think may become unintelligible. That's Lear. In such a scenario, learning might then be a form of radical hope. Not hope as an effective and ultimately insipid orientation toward definitive projected outcomes, but rather hope as a longing or desire for things that we do not fully and can never understand. And I'm thinking a lot, again, about Jack's paper and the scene of the two girls in the abandoned peer building, right? Like, there's, there's no future here. But it doesn't undercut in any way the affirmation that's being enunciated in the act of screaming. That remains in that place. That place will change. They will grow up. They won't get what they want. But that doesn't change that act of affirmation in that moment. There would always be a dialogic struggle within the uni this university that we simply desire that never arrives. And this could be a form of friendship. Learning as the sort of encounter modeled by Lauren Berlant and Lee Edelman in Sex or the Unbearable, where dialogue commits us to grappling with negativity, non-sovereignty, and social relations, not only as abstract concepts, but also as the substance and condition of our responses and our responsibilities to each other. That's for Lance and Edelman. And I would add, to the world more largely as well. The university is the site of figuring out what the university is and agreeing ahead of time and claiming it as a right that we will never find out. You can't sell that plan to administrators. The university to come would constitute a collective project for which there is no foreseeable future but on behalf of which future we can agree while continuing to disagree about all sorts of things that at the very least we care. sophistication. 
I do not myself anticipate ever practicing by hiking. My view is that if we care about the nature that is no longer nature, it's best that we stay out of it altogether. But I do think the single most important thing for any creature to learn through education or psychoanalysis or whatever means, or through being cared for or being taken care of, is that it is a mortal creature, ever-changing, and in its organic form, subject to the limit of death. The joys of creatureliness are equally important to living in a post world. I am not opposed to going outside. It's possible to go outside when you go inside. There are many ways to go outside the clinic and the university, too. I just don't want to go outward bound. The issue I want to address is how we now conceive phenomenologically of the topology of the relationships among classrooms, clinics, inner and outer worlds, especially because I, you, Eileen, have been such a visionary creator of deinstitutionalizing processes and practices. The classroom is unquestionably intersubjective, transpersonal space and event. What are its therapeutic possibilities given that group therapy techniques are not appropriate in the nonetheless highly groupified scene of academic learning? One of my former professors once said to me that asking students how they <coughs> felt about a poem was an ipso facto admission of pedagogical incompetence. Given what we have learned about perceptions and affects in the intervening years, I am now sure he was wrong. In the humanities and fine arts, we can help our students think about what feelings are, how feelings work, what kinds of intelligence they represent, and why they are so often so difficult either to communicate to or hide from other beings. At the same time, we learn to see, hear, and touch what emotions do images evoke in us? What is the intonational range of a line of verse? Why, where does a poem place us? And uh, I'm stressing here this connection between thinking and feeling. Um, our practice can emphasize the integration of thinking and symbolizing with affect and sensation, and in this way help us learn about the learning process as we go. All facts and ideas have valence, both positive and negative, as the psychologist so lyrically put it. Learning could include awareness of this principle. If Texan students need to unlearn the idealized version of U.S. history they are now taught in high school when they get to college or university, I believe again that this process must include mourning, i.e. <coughs> helping them understand that knowledge and knowledge production have valence, that we all become attached to particular narratives, conceptualizations, and beliefs and that we understand them better when we understand how and why we are attached to them. So we can ask students about the range of feelings inspired in them by specific concepts and vice versa. We can help our students cultivate and enjoy the crucial real-time activities of interpretation and expression that make relationships possible in the first place. We can help them value error, failure, and surprise and we can help them work through the ideas and attitudes that severely limit the potential and richness of their life experience if we help them mourn them. We can introduce our students to the mind's real-time efforts to know itself, the world, and the minds of others, to see that the mind's waywardness is part and parcel of its plasticity, that our species has learned to talk about feelings as a way of making, enabling use of them, that the ambiguities of language are precisely what give it its powers of connectivity in the form of the spreading activations Norman Holland discusses in his book Literature in the Brain, earlier called by Freud associational pathways. We can say things like think while pulling on our hair 
to illustrate embodiment. I'm not really serious about that, but, uh, <laughs> but there are all kinds of ways of making people conscious in the classroom of the role their body is playing in the thinking that they're doing at the same time. We can show them how free association can begin a new thinking process and how imagining, loving, and hating are aspects of remembering. There's nothing like the real time of live classroom experience for learning more about the everyday mental and emotional activities on which surviving and thriving depend. The best way to introduce students to the resourcefulness of their minds is to ask them to use them in situations that demand improvisation and colloquy. That is to say, in everyday life, regardless of whether one is lecturing or teaching a small seminar. Affects belong in the classroom. Again, I am speaking of the importance of integrating affect and cognition, as does the time required to reflect on them. Interpreting the minds of others is a precious survival skill many millions of years in the making, and its practice can therefore be a source of joy. Intersubjectivity is necessary to, if not sufficient, for learning. And that is what makes live class time experience so precious and difficult to simulate. The classroom is an ecology, but like all ecologies, infinitely enmeshed. The topology of the relationship between the classroom and the clinic especially with regard to the possible joys to be derived from encountering other minds. And I would add other forms of sentience, human and non-human, embodied in real time, in the realm of the aesthetic, etc. This feels important to me too. Both the classroom and the clinic are, or could be, critical sites for cultivating the arts and techne of the care of the self, for working on ourselves to invent, not to discover, as Foucault once remarked, improbable manners of being, and new affective intensities, relations not resembling those that are institutionalized. That's Foucault. This has something to do as well with philosophy. You know, I had this weird moment writing this, and I have to share this with you as an aside, that, you know, I kind of like, and this is, this is with no offense to anyone here, especially Jacques Mancier, but I personally felt very alienated from the discipline of philosophy in some ways. Alienated from its very patriarchal structure and its histories and the kind of fighting that goes on within it and, and its densities. And, um, and yet, you know, in the humanities, we have what we call critical theory, right? You know, it's like critical theory borrows almost everything from philosophy and talks to philosophy and comes out of philosophy. And I, I, I realized when I was writing this, I'm like, it's the most important discipline in some ways in the university. And yet, in the American university, it's just basically being eradicated. I mean, people might be talking about philosophy across disciplines, right? And being influenced by it. But philosophy departments, you know, they're going away. I mean, they're being eliminated. Or they're going analytical. So, could anything be more essential to learning or to the university than philosophy? Since it names the practice of what Bill Reddings called thought beside itself? Or what Leo Bersani has described as a lifelong devotion to intrinsically unending discussions? And these are Leo Bersani's words beautiful enigmatic line at the end of a complex reading of the pages. <clears throat> to put it not quite so dryly, a lifelong devotion to spiritually liquefying speech. This is a special kind of talk, unconstrained by consequences other than further talk. 
a type of conversation suspended in virtuality that's similar to the psychoanalytic relation, treats the unconscious, and these are Rasani's words, not as the determinant depth of being, but instead as derealized being, as potential being. This talk also entails what Arnya has called elsewhere a shared attention that is a consequence of attachment of intersubjective play, which is about becoming and never about finishing. Both the classroom and the clinic, as well as the signifying arts, as Arnya has described them in various writings, invite an effective companionship in which we never finish working things out, but that doesn't mean we don't accomplish anything. Such sites as Arnya writes in one essay about Chaucer, and I love this, require friendly yet impersonal minds, extimate figures who enact a sort of disinterested pastoral care. Healers, narrators, therapists, teachers. In pre-modern narratives, these figures were always liminally situated. In Arnya's words, in homes not their own, in the woods and clearings, anonymous throats away from the main business of the day. Although I think this site is also the banquet hall. Thinking, you know, again, of Plato. Away from the main business of the day, what today might it mean to live and practice pedagogic relations as forms of care of the self and affected, non-possessive companionship in the liminal spaces so necessary for engendering encounters with other friendly minds and with error, failure, and surprise where we can talk endlessly with no end to our talking. I'm looking at Michael now. The university has become increasingly hostile towards such liminal spaces, and maybe it always was. I think about James Murray, who invented the Oxford English Dictionary but wasn't allowed to go to Oxford, or he wasn't allowed in the halls or the dining room or the library. Can you imagine doing this for Oxford but they won't let you in the library? What the fuck? <laughs> so what's this university? Where, where is that hospitable university again? Um, the university was never quite the right place for the university. <laughs> However, it continues to be an important site for keeping open the question of thought and for fostering various important modes of effectively wired cognitive experiments. But that doesn't mean we can't also have a vagabond academy, especially when so many of us are hanging on to the university and the world by the skin of our teeth and our minds. Um, okay. We might even distinguish between the university as a certain institution of knowledge communication and academia, with a capital A, is just knowledge communication. There's no necessary connection between the two. Frames matter, though. This is what Arnie's arguing. And of course, as she points out, the classroom and the therapist's office are important holding environments. But if the mind's waywardness is part and parcel of its plasticity, then let's try to engage a wandering pedagogy. Not necessarily in the style of outward bound, I don't like to hold hoods or hike, but it, unlike, and I don't box like Paul, and, you know, I, don't, I don't have no sound effects. <laughs> Let's try to engage wandering pedagogies. Let's have some courage to depart existing institutions in order to form new ones, new desiring assemblages for our embodied importantly embodied pedagogies. Or let's hunger down within the institution and refuse to comply. Why are we so afraid to comply? I mean, to not comply, why? Why? Why do we do everything they tell us to do? Perhaps teaching at the institution has always been in some sense adversarial and subversive and even quietly so, because under the radar behind a closed door, largely undocumented and in many respects unremarked upon. I mean, for all the assessment, much of what happens in teaching isn't witnessed by many people or seen 
or documented fully. There's wonderful opportunities there, and they happen every day to do something subversive. Of course, we, do, we all do that. We all think our teaching is subversive right before we leave the classroom and fill out the assessment protocols. <laughs> There's something importantly private and intimate, while also impersonal about the pedagogic scene. A lesson I actually first learned from Simone Bay. No matter how publicly situated you might be. I'm reminded of something Leotard wrote in 1978 about his experience teaching philosophy at Vincennes in a beautiful and somewhat despairing essay titled Endurance and the Profession. At the time that Leotard wrote this essay, the philosophy faculty had lost the right to grant degrees, and yet students were still showing up to study philosophy there. Christopher Finks has referred to Leotard's anguished reflections on his teaching at that time as a pedagogy on the verge of disaster. And that essay is in the book, Pedagogies of Disaster, which is out there. This is Leotard. The concessions to what you feel is expected become rarer. You'd like to neglect even what your own mind <laughs> desires. Make it accessible to thoughts it doesn't expect. You are unfaithful in your alliances like the barbarians of clusters, but for a different reason. You're at war with institutions of your own mind and your own identity, and you know that with all this, you're probably only perpetuating Western philosophy, it's laborious libertinage, and it's obliging equanimity. At least you know that the only chance or mischance to do so lies in setting philosophy beside itself. When I read those words, I experienced something of a shock. Because I recognized the phrase, in the phrase, setting philosophy beside itself, an echo with Bill Redding's description of the university to come as the place where we simply place thought beside itself, without ever asserting the need for consensus. <coughs> then I noticed that Redding's was the editor of Leotard's collected political writings in which this essay is included. It's, it's a wonderful reading moment, right? You're like, what? So I trace this line of affinity of thought to also say or claim that the university to come must also be a place of the affinity of thought. And the medievalist leather etymology, affinity refers to a marriage, a relationship that is like a marriage because it's chosen, as opposed to a marriage that's, or a relation that's con, consanguinous. Sorry, that's a little muddled, but the point is it's a freely chosen relation. It's a form of love. This is a place where thought continually suspends itself in its encounters with other thought by which it is always limbed and bordered, because affinity also means to be bordered by. It's a marriage, and it's a form of being bordered by something else that doesn't overtake you, but it's there beside you. This affinity would of necessity be difficult, but it would still be affinity, a closeness and intimacy that is important because chosen freely between ourselves between us. This finally is the scene and also the event for me of learning at the university. Something that we hold in common, but tenderly because it requires a very light touch. This scene and this event is never just yours or mine. It shimmers into being between us every time we allow our thinking to be undone by each other. i.e. sense, feel, and enjoy our creatureliness. In the virtual ecstasy of the mindscape, anything can happen, <coughs> just as the ecstasy of the outdoors uh, opens it to creative possibility. 
how might we best design and enrich, enable changes of embodied and environed minds? One of the things we are trying to offer to you today is a platform for newly creative thinking about how we might deliver alternative skills to graduate students who can't or don't choose to become professors. Uh, that is, take that issue out of the sort of hygiene, you know, over here, you go to career services or seminars on alternative careers, but again, it's not integrated intellectually, philosophically, et cetera, et cetera, with, uh, with the work of the department that these graduate students live in. Uh, well, they live in all sorts of places, but there are departments among them. Uh, so we have uh, the possibility of a platform for newly creative thinking about how we might deliver alternative skills to graduate students so that we might open the university to the kinds of learning and working through enabled by movement and making and acting as well as acting skills or arts and crafts only sound boring because we have scorned the materiality associated with them, preferring the more putatively spiritual pursuits of theory. If we can use theory to cultivate and maintain awareness of what is entailed in action and enactment, we will be able to keep on testing the frame of psychoanalysis and perhaps open up for ourselves the enjoyments entailed in all the kinds of work that is the late uh, that we do. Thank you. ideas of all sorts, right, in terms of curriculum, in terms of the management of faculty or whatever. But I, I feel, for me personally, when I say stay in and hunker down, I'm thinking of something more radical in terms of protest. In the United States, 70% of teaching faculty are adjunct right now, which is insane. And But that's also a lot of bodies. So, it might be worse now, but, but you know, I'm thinking of something like, no, we're not leaving the institution, we want it back, you know? Uh, and I think faculty and students should, they should engage in some radical acts of resistance within the institution in order to ideally uh, force some kind of change in what's going on right now in terms of how much money is being granted to administrators and how much power they have to enact protocols and outcomes and what are called strategic initiatives that um, are not, uh, that do not benefit the project of learning as, as I envision it. You know, and I think as a lot of people are, I would say actually most of the papers today so far kind of share something in common in terms of the idea that learning is continually unsettled, doesn't have specific outcomes or even specific histories that have to be adhered to, and uh, you know, 
it's hard to make that argument to administrators that we don't know what the outcome is, but we're working on it without ever <laughs> hoping to arrive at it kind of thing, you know. Um, we don't necessarily care about the past or the future. Do you like that? Do you like that plan? Um, no, we don't. You know, but I, I think we should refuse to work. I think we should stay inside and refuse to work. So that's what I think. Thank you. Um, all brilliant and, and, and very complicated. But there's one thing that seems quite simple, and it's the use of the word university instead of the university or the institution. Uh, and it, it seems to refer to one thing, but no two universities are, are anything, no two departments, no two positions in the same department are, are identical. I mean, you know, I work at such and such, you know, I work at Shipkick College University, I work at Oxford University, I work. You know, they're all very, very different things. I, I talked to Sam last night for uh, a good couple of hours. He was explaining to me this, the range of things that the word university can mean in America, which is actually news to me. And now I've worked for three or four universities in the UK, and they're all completely different. Some are completely stifling. You have no agency, you have no freedom. Some are completely fragmented, and you can use that to your advantage to get paid like. Uh, you know, so I wondered if, if it's just a couple it's not really a question, it's just that we talk about the university, sometimes it's a philosophical idea, which I think is a bit of a function of what we're talking about, but also you need to be aware that it's not one, one thing. I, I would just say quickly, and then I'm going to see if Arnie wants to comment on this too. This reminds me of Jack's clip from Monty Python in order to underscore the point where the uh, activists are insisting on their right to claim something that isn't possible and may never be possible. Right? But uh, for me, when I say the university, it's with a capital U, which I kind of borrow from Bill Reddings. It's not an act, it's not a place. It's not a specific institution. It's, you know, it's symbolic, you know, it's symbolic. But I don't think we should give up on a symbolic ideal of some sort, while also never insisting that it be you know, universalized, right? So I'm thinking of activities that we would engage in as teachers that are not, not tied to specific institutions, but just some kind of philosophy that we would have in common about what it is we think we're doing. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for such a complicated and uh, affecting discussion and um, so many facets of the question of learning. And I just had a few bits of free association and then maybe come to like, a question that might be interesting to continue. Um, I kept thinking as I'm listening to uh, a question of vulnerability, uh, yeah, either in biology, in ecology, in sociality, uh, in subjectivity, in intersubjectivity, and the dangers um, or the attacks on linking or the way your citation of beyond of how easily it becomes for the mind to make a thought into a bad object. And it's very difficult to keep that in mind as a, as a teacher, to begin to listen differently to what it is that um, students are saying to us as they work through materials or not work with materials. It's very hard for us as professors not to turn <coughs> objectives into a bad object. That there's a, that there's a, a, a hate, <coughs> you said it very early, <coughs> a hatred of education that is very, very difficult to come to terms with that may in fact affect our pedagogical imagination as well as our conception of what learning is or not learning or what history is or what the present is. So I, these are just some of the thoughts. My, my question, and it, it, it's quite rare, frankly, to be in a conference and to have psychoanalysis be part of the discussion uh, without a, a strong anger towards uh, the question of mental life. Um, and so uh, my question, I guess, is uh, how you see uh, the university as um, a, a place that um, may open itself to a, a theory of learning that, it, that, it, that resides on the border between 
biology and meaning, which is where the, the question of the drives and the question of the object um, are situated, I suppose. It's sort of an abstract um, uh, concept, but uh, if you just have thoughts about, about this kind of experiment of the clinic, the classroom, the outside, the university. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the highlight of vulnerability um, because I'm so serious about creatureliness as the, the matrix for all of this, that that, that is what we are. Um, and following from that, I have to ask how much we think, we really think about vulnerability in the classroom, um, including the vulnerability of the teacher. I mean, I know we think about that in all kinds of sort of practical ways and so forth and so on, but there's, there's a thinking uh, that that needs to be done about the fact that the classroom is a minefield um, and that thoughts threaten to become bad objects all the time. They threaten to become intrusive objects. Um, introspection is something that most people don't enjoy. Uh, psychological studies, at any rate, have demonstrated this time and again that when given the opportunity to spend 15 minutes with yourself in a quiet room, uh, you'd rather do otherwise. Um, since I've been flying recently, though I wasn't in a quiet room, you know, I mean, it's just, I, I'm just going through this like, now I'm just listen to your mind. Now I can't stand it, I'm so bored, I'm going to die. And, <laughs> Hate, uh, the word should have been in this paper, as well as love, for obvious reasons. But it was in the paper. You, start, you started by saying people hate education. Oh, that's right. And and that's good, good for me. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. <laughs> Jet lag. Jet lag. Yeah. Um, so I'll give you one example, which is uh, I teach a uh, a uh, senior seminar called Language and Feeling. And at the end of the seminar, I teach a short story by John Berryman called Wash Far Away, uh, which is about teaching Lycidas, uh, in which there is a professor who is depressed uh, and in denial about the nature of his depression or the extent of it. And uh, he, he goes into his English class to teach Lysidas and um, the obtuseness uh, of the students in insisting that Milton must have actually felt something for Edward King or must have felt something because like why would he have had to know him personally to feel sorry that he died Etc. When um, opens up an experience for him that's very transformative, though it's handled in a very subtle, quiet kind of way. Um, and what's interesting about this when I teach it is that my students kind of look at me out of the corner of their eyes, you know, like is she trying to tell us, you know, something about? what it's like for her to be with us. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course I am. Um, so I, I, I think there are many ways that we can introduce without intruding uh, uh, the concept that uh, that the classroom is a charged and driven Hi. Um, uh, thank you. Um, 
I wanted to follow up on um, this notion of vulnerability because um, I, th I think it's an exciting idea to think through and um, the classroom as a place which we need to think at the same time vulnerability and I especially like the linking of unlearning and undoing and the relationship between undoing and vulnerability. But I wanted to compare that to some of Jack's comments this morning about triggering because it seems in that instance there's a certain claim of vulnerability that's being made and so I wanted if you could talk about why there are certain ways of thinking about vulnerability in the context of the classroom that we should be um, receptive to and why there are others that we should be hostile towards. Well the simplest answer or comment I can think of to make is that is that the, the request uh, for warnings uh, is, is a demand that we be protected from our, our vulnerability. And uh, unsurprisingly, my view of vulnerability is that it's something we would do well to find bearable. Um, and so I think, of course, issuing warnings, therefore, would be exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, this actually happened at my campus recently when the, the student council recently asked uh, the, the faculty senate if it would consider at least promulgating resolutions that this might be a good idea, you know, without sort of constraining um, academic freedom. And, uh, and our answer was, you know, no. <laughs> For the same reasons that Jack mentioned, you know, if on the syllabus it says, you know, uh, you know, this is the course in which you will, you will learn about grisly things, then you know, you should be prepared for experiencing them. So the category of experience needs to be in there too. If affects belong in the classroom, affective experience belongs in the classroom, and we all know that there's a kind of learning that happens in the body and happens on the level of affect, that if that accompanies metacognition, uh, it's much more exciting, right? Uh, and and uh, a much more memorable, rememberable uh, experience for the student. Um, but uh, you know, I just want to stress. I'm sure this is clear to all of you that I'm not talking about talking about personal feelings, you know, in the classroom. Um, exactly. Uh, more like uh, how does this idea make me feel? I I I I'm going to I haven't tried this yet, but I'm going to have, have you all seen those um, <coughs> uh, uh, those cheap uh, in America when you're a psychotherapy trainee, you're given these sheets that illustrate it's like 30 different little cartoon faces that show different emotions. You ever seen this? You know, to I'm gonna take that in. Because when, I mean, we have this experience when we, when we are with our patients of how radically impoverished, in fact, the language of affect is. Um, you know, how uh, time and again, um, you know, what was the feeling that you were experiencing at a certain moment. Well, I was just thinking that, right? Um, so, you know, affect is only intermittently connected, right? Uh, the brain is working on connecting, right, to the more cognitive, uh, cognitive so that's kind of what I'm what I'm reaching for, and I think it's risky for students to do that, but it's it they feel pretty, you know they feel pretty thrilled sometimes to to realize that you know ideas. Happy with the 
Dystopian Professor versus the Dystopianism for the University. And I'm just curious about that. Curious about it for a lot of reasons. It's like, so there's, you know, what is, is, does that have something to do with where we have control and where we don't have control? Or not that we have control, we don't. Uh, but anyway, I'm just, I think for both of you, that, that distinction, I don't really think you hold it theoretically, but I think you held it effectively in your discussions, or like, and I'm just, I'm super curious about what that means. Um, so, that's what I'm saying. And I don't, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of, like, I don't have an answer I could give to that myself. So I just thought of it because I was listening to you. And the other thing has to do with uh, the way that when professors talk about teaching, the classroom is a space of intensity and focus and clarity, and and everyone has something they want. And I don't really think that's a, uh, that's because when we go in, we have a plan mostly. And I think there's a, that's not a good representation of a lot of uh, interactions in a classroom. And this has to do with the question of partly what teaching can do. And so I'm going to offer something we haven't talked about yet today but also just a little bit to think about the difference between a therapeutic situation and a classroom. Um, and this question isn't gonna be a long time. And I'm sorry. Uh, and it goes like this. So I think that mostly people walk around relatively disorganized, affectively, and also with respect to intention. They, they, they take a class, you ask them what they want from the class. The stuff they say about that is like pretty, I, would, I don't want to use negative language. I don't want the language of emptiness and hollowness to sound negative. I just mean because technically, they don't know they kind of have an interest. They have a looseness in relation to the project of learning. And one of the things that they might be surprised by, and I think Jack's work in here has told a little bit of this, which is they might be surprised that they care about something and they might not have wanted to care that much. They, they, they might be surprised into a <coughs> that they might not have wanted. But in any case, the scene of the classroom is a scene where something is organized. It's often not a scene where people come in with, with uh, clear aims and intentions. I don't mean students. I mean faculty is each other, but students. So it seems to me one of the things you do when you teach is you help organize and then color relation to stuff. Especially, as I've said in my blog about teaching, we don't we don't give our students time to learn anything. We give them time to, to cast their eyes over things. And they often have enough time to think about it before they get in the room. So you're partly just trying to remind them what they've cast their eyes over. Yeah. Anyway, I think that, so we have, you know, we share a lot of languages of attachment and objectness and the question of what, what constitutes an object. For me, an object is something you've invested in. And it's not all things you know. It's the things that you invest kind of continuity in. And I think that's related to how you think about it too. But often, when you're teaching, one of the things you do is you're organizing objects for people to, to walk around and see what, how they think about those objects and think about whether they have a relation to those objects. And I, was, I didn't hear anything in your, in your presentation about the possibility that people aren't always organized effectively or intellectually when they're coming into the space. They don't always, they don't always have a name. They don't always have an object. And so that the space of classroom isn't always as intense dramatic as the way we describe it. And I was super curious what was going to be that. I would be sorry to think that there was anything in my paper that suggested that I thought students came into the classroom with organized ideas about the reading that they didn't do the night before. <laughs> um, so I'm not entirely sure what it is in the paper that you're reacting to that sounds like a claim uh, of that nature, other than uh, perhaps the appeal to uh, uh, the possibility of, a, of excitement through uh, integration of cognitive and affective experience, which um, I'm not anticipating, you know, any prior work on that by my students. Um, I think that as a lot of people have pointed out, boredom is an affect. Um, 
often uh, a mark of where repression is though. So I think though students can come in very dazed and disorganized in terms of how they're operating consciously. Uh, I think that they have very powerful investments in certain things uh, that can often be closely linked um, to uh, what might come up in a literary text, for example. Um, I mean, the resistance to learning uh, is part of all of this. So I would say, uh, not that this is a new thought, but you know, that it's crucial to de-idealize the classroom um, precisely, precisely on those grounds. Uh, I teach at uh, at, at what's known uh, in the States as the party school. Uh, in fact, nearly all of my academic career, for some reason, <laughs> has occurred in major party schools that, you know, went the whole gamut of the seasons at University of Virginia, where I was a graduate student. It was Easter weekend, um, huge blowout, you know, misbehavior party. Uh, at Dartmouth, it was winter, winter carnival, um, ice sculptures on the green, uh, mayhem everywhere else. And at UC Santa Barbara, it's Halloween. And the school is always sort of lamenting its party school image and wondering how it can fix that in terms of public relations and so forth. But I, I think it, there's a fundamental misapprehension there uh, about the relationship between revelry and study. Um, and uh, I find uh, that my students find that a very interesting topic uh, because uh, it's easy to think of the classroom as a place of boredom and difficulty or being asked to do things that are not exactly in your comfort zone, etc., etc. And then you go to this party, which is a completely different kind of space and event, uh, in order to relax and unwind. Um, but there's a very long history uh, of uh, association between revelry and study uh, throughout the Middle Ages, for example. And uh, I think it's possible to energize some crossover thinking there with our students that can make them more conscious, aware of what their boredom in the classroom can mean again. The, you know, and uh, and not conflate, but uh, make some associations between their supposed leisure time and the time they spend in the classroom or the time they spend studying. I just wanted to say one quick thing about this too. Um, I. And this is, I know you're going to think I'm making this up. Um, I only taught, you know, at the rank of, you know, Professor River for about 10 years. And I never prepared other than to read. I never took notes. I never put together presentations. Um, it was physically exhausting. I mean, I, I, I literally burned out on it. And, and when I would teach, you know, I'd be wrung out of sweat after every single class for my anxiety. Um, but I mention it because I agree with what you're saying about the incompleteness, <coughs> right, of the pedagogical scene, let's say. And uh, in many ways, teaching can be a very frustrating experience because you, you might have intentions. <laughs> and then you know they're going to be thwarted, right? And what I found is, 
you can prepare for the class or you cannot prepare. You do not know what is going to happen. So why not cultivate that state of affairs? So I mean, I kind of figured that out when I was learning to teach in graduate school and you're still younger and you're doing it the way they tell you to do it, you know? And you're like, that didn't work, I don't understand. I thought if I had a plan, everything would work really well. I'm not recommending what my method ended up becoming. But this goes back to Paul's question about what kind of university are you actually talking about? We're all at different places. And, and then back to your first question about what's the relation between the supposed dystopian scene of the university writ larger and this utopian scene of the classroom, right? And I think teaching is often figured in utopian terms that are also kind of bullshit, too. You know what I'm right? So, so I just decided because the thing, the two things, like your, your, your essay on Start and this idea of the collaborative risk of a shared disorganization, and we mentioned Cedric earlier, uh, Cedric's idea of reparative readings that offer resources to the inchoate self. You know, like I have these things, I, I, these things are like memorized in my brain. So let's make the classroom some kind of artistry of that state of affairs. So I did teach that way, and it was very rough on me, and I, I can't do it anymore. I mean, I would do it in maybe you know once or twice or something. It was thrilling, exhausting, amazing, and, and horrifying. Um, but, and it didn't always work either, but, but, but it was because of what, you know, what you're saying. Like, I recognize that, and, I wanted to cultivate that, and I like to jump out of planes or something, I don't know. I mean, I don't like to jump out of planes or ski, so this was my version of that. Or do Tai Chi or box, or anyway, that's my comment on that. One final question. I, I mean, I know we're short on time, and I, I want to ask about seven more questions about what we just said, I mean, but I'll try to be very succinct, just three little points. Uh, the first, I think, is really more just uh, thanks or praise, but I just think your line, the university was never quite the right place for the university, so much that can be done about that, done with that production work. I, I took one of the immediate uh, deductions from that, which is that we shouldn't focus all of our attention on what we might want to build as a university with the capital U symbolic at this place in ruins of the university. Uh, but I wanted to ask, this was uh, the second point very quickly, it, I also took some of your later comments about what's going on in, in the university, the actual place, as suggesting a different kind of corollary from that, which is that even if the university was never quite the right place for the university, it may be that today the university is one of the only places we might still build the university. And I wanted to know if I was, if I was reading right there. Yes. If I was, then, then my third is an actual question, which is a completely unfair one, which you might rightly say, uh, that's not my project, that's not my problem. But I wanted to think a little bit about the strategy of potentially building that place, particularly in terms of what you said in your talk about um, your frustration, which is my frustration <coughs> as well, of the ways in which those people who are, are in um, privileged positions in the university do comply with these transformations. And it seems to me, I've been witnessing clients uh, <coughs> at my own university where we've got a new president, uh, a new dean brought in to carry out the president's will of neoliberal transformation. That's a huge gift that you guys got. Yeah, we didn't get any of that. That's, that's, but you don't get it in the case. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but just witnessing the way in which uh, I've seen some practical answers to your question of why do people comply, and it's 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 a, it's a piece of it. It's well, would you like to instead of being the faculty member who seems to be making trouble for this new dean who's carrying out all these transformations, why don't you become a dean and we'll triple your salary? Um, and it works. They become a dean and their salary's tripled, and now all of a sudden they're on the side of the dean that they were the loudest person screaming at. Or the people who, um, at, at a place that have these options, then go to another place. And so now what you have left is the people who weren't taking the structural um, uh, stance against the transformation. And it seems to be part of it in, in the United States system is about the way the tenure system makes it possible that for so long, tenure was kind of a proxy for some other form of organized collective action. It can work as if it was a union. Uh, but of course, it's very, very different from one where we have 70% of classes being taught by adjuncts and interim faculty. You have so few people in that, and you have this kind of survival struggle. Well, if I don't comply and make a big ruckus, does that mean that um, I'm complaining about what is a great situation compared to all those adjuncts? What people who have come in positions to teach quite as much, et cetera? Any thoughts 
kind of moving outside of the university that you might have about how that non-compliance is structured. Can I say one quick thing first, even though you're not talking no, no, to me? No, no, please. <laughs> Um, one strategy in department meetings, I'm sorry to get so banal, but, but it's really to, to simply insist at every turn uh, on the question of do we have to do this. It's, you know, in that sense, very simple. Um, what's going to happen to us if we don't do this? Or, for example, recently at my university, um, the question of workload. Um, it is not the dean's prerogative to decide about workload. It is the individual department's prerogative to decide about workload. That is how many courses its faculty are going to teach, and that's one of the things that varies across my university from department to department. But, our dean requested that we form a subcommittee on workload, <laughs> more work in other words, uh, that would then report to him about workload uh, and so that he uh, would be in the loop and you know, could participate in the decision making about workload. And I said in this department re meeting, you know, why, why are we doing this for precisely this reason? Uh, so that faculty prerogative, I think, it can get worn away uh, easily in those kinds of cooperative gestures which you, you don't necessarily lose by taking charge of. So that's the other side of that, is to uh, is to <laughs> simply do the things that you want to do uh, and not wait for anyone's sanction uh, until they notice and, you know, come and tell you you can't do that anymore. But, you know, that's less likely, right, than the, the, the candle no at the outset. It's always a no at the outset, so sorry to poach on, on your comments, but. I'll just say something very quickly because we have to wrap up the session. Um, it's, it's such an old-fashioned notion, but it almost always works. It's like collectivist action. Nothing can be more difficult, like so difficult, but nothing can be more necessary if you want change on the inside. That's the only way. You can have individual heroic acts, you know, and stuff like that, but it's collectivist action. And, um, you know, think about what just happened at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Now that thing is just blowing up. And it's just about one faculty member who's been, you know, gotten rid of because of his Twitter feed, but even just this morning there was a news item about one of the board members voicing their dissent. So, you know, what, who knows where this is gonna lead, but the point is if everyone gets together and, and, and just says, hey, we're not, this is crazy, we're not, we don't like this, we don't want this, you know, Stuff can happen, but it won't happen without collective action. And I think tenure track faculty really have to join hands with that chunks. They can't look at each other as oppositional groups or groups that are not allowed to care enough about each other for reasons of elitism or privilege or status or whatever. I mean, it's such a huge body of people, you know, it's amazing what they could do if they would be collected. But remember, I also said in my talk that people really suck. <laughs> and that's the biggest impediment to collective action, to be honest. People suck. But that's not end up with the person, though. Okay, thanks there to Eileen and Ryan.